because what you don't know about energy can kill you. Here's Alex Epstein. Welcome to Power Hour. I'm Alex Epstein. On this week's episode, I have a different kind of conversation than usual. This is actually somebody interviewing me. And quick background, a month or two ago, I got contacted by a researcher just out of college named Emily Harari, and she was doing some research on the issue of consensus, and she emailed me a bunch of questions that I had never addressed publicly, and I thought, hey, these would I'd like to answer these questions, but I don't want to just answer them for one researcher. I might as well answer them for the whole Power Hour audience. So I said, hey, I'm happy to talk as long as you're happy to record the conversation and I can share it with Power Hour viewers and listeners. And she agreed. And so we had the call. She asked a bunch of interesting questions and I answered them. Now the topic is the topic of consensus. Now this is a really interesting topic because I think it's something where there is legitimacy, but the way it's used is very illegitimate now. For more on what exactly I mean by that and how else to think about consensus, well, here's my interview with Emily Harari. Hi, everyone. Uh, this is an interesting experiment I'm about to do. I'm joined by Emily Harari, who's a recent graduate of Berkeley and a mutual acquaintance of ours put us in touch and she wanted to ask me some questions about my views, including the issue of consensus. And she had a bunch of interesting questions and I thought, well, it might be interesting for people to hear this discussion, especially since some of these questions I haven't talked about that much publicly. So, uh, yeah, Emily, welcome. And uh, tell us anything you want us to know uh, from the outset. Yeah, thanks, Alex. So I'm interning at Blue Marble Space Institute of Science, or BMSIS. And as an intern this summer, I had the chance to do a capstone project on anything I wanted, really. I'm a science communication intern, so I'm interested in how we communicate science to the public. And I thought I would tackle this concept of scientific consensus. The best example, I think, in current conversations is the climate change conversation and the talk about scientific consensus there. So I thought I would come to you and talk to you about your opinions. Um, and I'm interested to hear what you think. I have some questions lined up, so I'm looking forward to this conversation. Now I can't hear you anymore. That's... Oh, I'm really sorry. I, I, that was an unbelievable coincidence how precisely I accidentally hit the mute button. Uh, can you hear me now? <laughs> I can hear you now. <laughs> oh, I was just saying, uh, I think you had mentioned this when we spoke earlier, your anything you say that's an opinion is just your opinion, right? I know you're mostly just going to be asking right. me questions, but oh, just right. wanted to give you that protection. Yes, I should I should have added that. So uh, exactly what you said, any opinions I voice in this conversation are a reflection of my own personal thoughts. They are not a reflection of Blue Marble um, and the opinions of the amazing scientists in that organization, because I can only speak for myself today. Right. And if I, if I convert you into a fellow fossil fuel fanatic, we cannot assume they're converted as well. <laughs> All right, let's get started. Ask, ask whatever you want. All right. So we'll go through some basic questions, but I definitely want this to be a free flowing conversation and an exchange of ideas. So I'll start with one, which is pretty open ended. Do you trust consensus research? Uh, <clears throat> I would say sometimes. So let me say something about consensus, which people might not expect. And I had a Forbes article about this years ago called the unscientific consensus, which you might want to look at and other people might want to look at. And, I read it, and, yeah. Oh, you read it, okay. Yeah. And there, there's this view that comes up with climate, uh, but it comes up with other issues, that science and consensus are opposites and there's a certain truth to that in that it's true that, you know, a percentage of people in a field agreeing on an answer does not cause that answer to be true. And there's this famous example of, there was a book called 100 Authors Against Einstein, including some scientists, but also other intellectuals. And he had this famous response to the effect of, if they had been right, one would have been enough. 
Mm -hmm. And the idea is, well, I'm right about, I don't know if it was general relativity or special relativity or, or both, but it's ultimately, you know, truth is objective. It's out there in the world and human beings are fallible and we need to go through mental processes that give us the best possible chance of reaching the truth. And the fact that a number of people in a field uh, agree with something does not in any way uh, make it true. Mm -hmm. So that part of this criticism of consensus, I agree with. But there's another sense in which consensus is extremely important. And the reason it's extremely important is because of the division of labor. So in a free society, in a modern society, we have a division of labor where we each specialize in different things. And within the realm of knowledge, there's just an incredible level of specialization that allows human beings to discover incomparably more knowledge than we could if each individual was just trying to learn everything for themselves. Like you tried to be the Aristotle uh, of ancient Greece. He was, sometimes people say he was the last person who knew most of what there was to know. Um, but you know, now there's more to know in some small aspect of physics than one person could, could possibly know, or certainly more in physics as a whole. So we need, we have this problem where there's a division of labor where we cannot confirm things for ourselves in every field, but we want to benefit from the discoveries of other fields. And so the question is, how do we do that? We need some way of getting the expert uh, analysis or opinion in that field that is, you know, that is the highest possible chance of being true. Mm -hmm. And one means of doing that, it's not, a, it's not a guaranteed means, but it's a valuable means, and it's certainly a valuable starting point, is to know what is the consensus in the field. And what, what that means to me, though, is what are the range of viewpoints? Who holds them? Mm -hmm. You know, what are their arguments and counter arguments? So I'll give an example before we deal with climate of uh, in the field of geology for the nature of oil and gas. So the, the common view, the, the dominant view of oil and gas is that it's they're what's called fossil fuels, which mean they come from ancient dead life. And there's a whole narrative about this. But there's another narrative, particularly involving natural gas. And there's a guy named, among others, there's Thomas Gold, who wrote a book called The Deep Hot Biosphere. So he was a, a physicist, not a geologist, but still a smart guy. And he made an argument that just as you know, natural gas, which is methane, like that kind of thing occurs in Saturn without any life. Mm -hmm. uh, so it, there's a massive amount of it that is what's called abiogenic. It doesn't come from a biological organism. And so if I want to learn about that, can, it's a valuable thing to know the consensus. That is, I want to know among geologists, what do they think and why? And what are the counter arguments uh, that each side have, uh, that each side has rather against the others so that I can have a, a better chance at reaching the truth. Now, the goal is not to get a single opinion and follow it blindly, right. uh, A, because I want to know the reasoning, but B, and this is just as important for the climate issue, I need to put it uh, in context. And particularly when you're talking about anything that affects human health or well-being, or life more broadly, like it's always going to be one factor among many. So we say, I mean, for example, you would want to know what's the consensus about different attributes of the coronavirus that we're dealing with. But then you have to integrate that knowledge with all the other effects. So if somebody's saying, well, we need to shut down X, Y uh, place, you need to think about, okay, well, what's true about this coronavirus, but then what's also, you know, what are the other things related to that, that policy? So the things with consensus are you generally want to know the reasoning, or at least have a sense of it. And then you definitely want to, you don't want to, you don't want to take orders from a consensus from specialists. You want to get knowledge that you can then uh, integrate. So I think the role of consensus research and, and when I trust it is to give an objective accounting of the, you know, the range of specialized opinion in a given area, um, but in a way that's given, that's not really prescriptive, or at least that's not generally prescriptive, but that's given as um, key key truths or key likely truths that we can then um, integrate. So in the realm of climate, I would want to know the kinds of things I talk about, but no, I would, I would want to know what is the consensus about the, um, in particular, I want to know the influence of rising CO2 levels 
on the global uh, climate system, the influence so far, the influence in the future, and that includes things like how does it affect uh, temperatures around the earth, and then how do those temperatures affect other things like storms and floods and drought, uh, et cetera. And depending on what kinds of specialists you want, then I'm also interested in things like how, uh, you know, depending on, on whether those are generally positive or negative, uh, how, how does human adaptation fit in? And one, just, uh, I'll stop in a second, but one interesting feature about the consensus and the, uh, on, on climate science and the view that we should, quote, listen to the scientists or listen to the climate scientists is there's very little regard for the fact that most climate scientists know almost nothing about climate adaptation. That's much more of an economist's uh, field. And that's, that's an example where consensus can really, uh, like where these consensuses that are trying to dictate policy, where they can really lead you astray because they're, not only can they misrepresent what people actually think, which I think happens with climate science, uh, but they can definitely misrepresent the implications of that. And they can actually, they can actually deter you from investigating relevant fields. So my example in climate science is there is so little interest in adaptation, even though as I've argued, uh, adaptation is the reason why we're 50 times safer from climate than we were 100 years ago. So at least so far, adaptation is the dominant driver of what makes a climate livable. It's not the order of changes that we've experienced in the climate, uh, global climate system so far, whatever their cause. Right. So that definitely brings up several points. I would comment that in science communication, it's interesting because we differentiate between two main paths for talking to people about science. There's this consensus message, which is it conveys that with the existing studies, what people generally seem to agree on. And then there's the evidence message, which kind of takes you through the experiment takes you through the process and then helps mm -hmm. you with the answer the scientists did. So I guess from your perspective, do you think that the consensus message and then the evidence message approach should both exist in science communication or do you think one is better than the other? Well, yes, I'm not, I, I would have to see how they're used in practice, but both of those sound, I mean, it sounds like you would want both mm -hmm. together. I mean, that's what I would, that's what I would want, but there's, there's, there's a, so part of the question with climate is how well is it done? And I know, I think you want to talk about national climate assessment. I think that would be a good example of where I think the way it's, um, I think the assessment is problematic and certainly the way the assessment is summarized and communicated, I, I regard as profoundly irresponsible. So I have some examples of, of that, but I guess one, one more thing to say about the categories you're talking about is there's a, there's a real hazard when, at least when you're dealing with political organizations, definitely when you're dealing with ideological organizations, of a, what were the two categories you mentioned? Right, so it's consensus message, which is the scientists agree on this, so, you know, naturally, you should probably trust the, the message. And then the second is the evidence message, which is I'll take you through the experiment. I'll walk you through the I see. process. Okay, yeah, so I'm sorry, I, I was listening. I, I, I focused more on the second, which I like. Well, yeah, the first one is, is I think dangerous. I mean, you have to do it to some extent, uh, but you know, one thing you need to do, I mean, so you need to tell your methodology for even how you know the consensus, because this comes up with this whole 97% thing that I've attacked in various forms. I think people think 97% of climate scientists agree, but they're not clear on what they, even what they agree on, why they agree, or how it was determined that mm -hmm. they agree. And I think all of those uh, people have a very wrong impression of, including I don't think the 97% claim is defensible for anything significant. Uh, it's only maybe only defensible for believe that humans cause some warming, but even there, I don't think it's been demonstrated. I think it's, uh, and, and the more, the better studies like the American Meteorological Society I think did one, and it was, it was some significant majority, but it wasn't 97%. The 97%, I think, has demonstrably bad uh, methodology. So I, I think the I think they really need to be uh, integrated, and they're they're definitely uh, and one hazard of if you look at how this functions with the the two biggest ones in the U.S. for climate are the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, 
their assessment reports, and then the National Climate Assessment, which I think was created by uh, George W. Bush. Was it George W. Bush or his dad? It was, it was his dad. It was the NCA, the National Climate Assessment. He started in 1990. Okay, got it. Yeah, so um, H. W. Bush. Thanks for uh, clarifying that. So he, yeah. So with both of these, the, there's this combination, and I know the UN one better, but there's this combination of a very in-depth report where there are different summaries of different kinds of science and different papers in the field. And then there's what's called a summary for policymakers. And certainly in the, in the case of the IPCC, this is kind of a famous slash notorious uh, phenomenon. And that's overwhelmingly generated by uh, political people. And there's just a huge hazard in that. And so there's just this common pattern of the summary for policymakers being far more extreme than the, in terms of dangers we face than uh, the actual report. So the reports tend to be very measured. They have a lot of language like, well, may or could. And then it's, it's much more definitive and extreme with the, the summaries for policymakers. And you know, one example of this is there's a guy named Richard Toll, T-O-L, who's a econ climate economist, who's definitely much more of a catastrophist uh, than I am. I don't know if you would agree with that characterization of him, but he, you know, he was in charge of one of these um, he was in charge of a major portion of UN report and he resigned because he thought the summary for policymakers was so egregious. This He talks about it and then there's a section on it in Michael Schellenberger's new book, uh, False Alarm. So I could talk also about how national climate assessment does that, but so I, I agree, I just wanna make clear, like I agree in principle that it is good to, it is good to understand consensus, but it really has to be specified clearly without kind of agenda and it, it needs to be explained clearly what the evidence is and I think the better way to do it is to give a high level sense of the evidence even in your summary of it and then to refer people to the uh, the details uh, mm -hmm. of it. Well I, I didn't realize you looked into the NCA the assessment so if you're ready to dive into it then I am. Yeah so I mean I don't I haven't looked into it. I've just seen over the years different things about it. Um, so I can give an example uh, of it, but I've been, or, or you can ask me about specific things, but I have not, I have not committed it to memory or even anything remotely. Um, like, so let me, let me share my example from it sure. and then you can ask anything uh, you want. And, and I, I want to credit th this particular, there are a bunch of people who are very good at doing these analyses where basically what they do is they, they look at how at how the assessment is reported by the mainstream media, then how the assessment is summarized for the media and for the general public. And then they look at what the research behind the assessment is and they show huge divergences. So uh, Bjorn Lomborg is amazing at this. He does this a lot in his book, False Alarm. In this case, this analysis I learned from uh, Oren Cass, who's a really smart guy who's commented a lot on these kinds of issues and is good at looking into the details. So. Uh, you know, he tells this, he was testifying in front of Congress and he told a good, uh, he gave a good account of this. So I just want to give him uh, credit because I'm drawing on him a lot. He, uh, but so he talks about it in November, 2018, the New York Times had, had a headline that said U.S. climate report warns of damaged environment and shrinking uh, economy. Mm -hmm. And there's, there's a subhead that said reduction of up to 10% of GDP. And mm -hmm. so you think like, oh my gosh, like our GDP is gonna go down by, ten. that's at least one interpretation. The other interpretation you could, um, and, and for example, and, and this was taken by politicians. So for example, Senator Edward Markey said on Twitter, according to the Trump administration's national climate assessment, with no action, climate change will result in 10% GDP loss by 2090. Mm -hmm. uh, okay, so what did it actually um, say? First of all, even if the 10% thing were true, it wasn't a 10% loss. It was 10% less than it theoretically would be without climate change. So if you had the exact same uh, energy costs and everything else that you would have with fossil fuels or what, if anything could replace fossil fuels, it was saying it'll be 10% less, but it could be 10% less of 
of an economy that was four times bigger. And that's the point CAS makes. So if you say we're four times, if the growth rate makes the world four times wealthier, then what it's saying is instead of four times wealthier, we'll only be, um, what is it, 3.9 times wealthier. Or if you do, no, it won't be that. It'll be, um, that's bad math by me. So it would be, it'll be 3.6 times wealthier. So that, all things being equal, you don't want to avoid that, but that's very different from 10% uh, GDP loss. So that's an example of just on the 10% how it's misrepresented. But then if you go into the report, what he points out is that there was a, um, the 10% was something that it was just on a, on a chart that was based on an article in science that showed that if there were eight degrees Celsius of warming, uh, then it would be this damage that was 10% of the GDP, um, you know, 10% less growth of GDP, basically. And as Cass points out, actually the National Climate Assessment didn't endorse this at all. Their higher scenario estimated warming only between 2.4 and 4.7 degrees. So already you have, so that, and on its chart, that would be one to 4% of GDP. So here you just get what's happening is it's just being misrepresented on so many different levels to make people think, oh, this is going to make us poorer. And this is consistent with the idea that climate is an actual catastrophe of the world. The world is going to get much worse and we might even go extinct. Uh, but in reality, it's saying we're going to become a little less rich. And then they took, and they even exaggerated that because it would basically mean, oh, it's, it's going to be 1% to 4% less. And I think there are a whole bunch of issues with the their confidence and their ability to project climate, and certainly their confidence to claim that it's going to be uh, a loss. But this is just a really clear-cut case where the National Climate Assessment, in part by having these graphics that show this 8 degrees Celsius, 10% loss, they are pandering to catastrophism. And then where the media are just taking that and running with that and making a worst-case scenario. So that's a that's a way and that's that's how the sausage is often made with consensus and then people think oh consensus you know as marky said climate change will result in 10 percent gdp loss by 2090 and then he's he'll repeat these things like listen to the scientists and so what you get is this complete misrepresentation that's not remotely uh even what the more extreme scientists say and you get that passed off as as proven science i regard this as just completely uh, unethical, and it's the kind of thing that at the very least something like the National Climate Assessment should be very, this is part of why they need to be very precise. They need to say, okay, this is what we mean, and this is what we don't mean, but there are all kinds of incentives for people involved to make it sound really, really uh, scary. So that's a case where people's, uh, people's view of what the National Climate Assessment says is radically different from what it actually says, but they have this confidence that it's it's science because they have this very sloppy uh, approach toward understanding and applying a consensus. Right. I think everyone can recognize how sensationalized the media has just become, uh, especially in, I think, today's political climate. Things get pretty polarizing pretty quickly. So if we were to focus then on maybe what we can control more, which is what they do with the climate assessment, uh, we can dive into that. So I'll just preface with, because people are listening, uh, a brief descriptor that, yes, like we said, uh, President Bush in 1990 started the NCA, the National Climate Assessment, and that the NCA includes two volumes that are released about every four years to advise Congress and the public. So volume one is the consensus report, and volume two is the risk assessment. So the report is more descriptive, and then the assessment, I believe, is designed to be more prescriptive, uh, which which you mentioned, uh, preferring the the descriptive sort of sort of report. So that report goes through six drafts or iterations until it's published, and the fifth draft is open to public comment. So in that second to last phase, the public can comment and then the National Academies of Sciences, uh, so I'll call them the academies, they will deliberate. Uh, they will deliberate behind closed doors, however, um, for, for several reasons that they cite. And I was wondering 
what your thoughts were on keeping those deliberations closed. Um, because it's true that there is debate and there are always going to be minority opinions, but the academies also cite, I think, some fair reasons for keeping that final deliberation behind closed doors. Uh, some of them including they don't want to lock down decisions before they've been made, and they don't want the integrity of the report to be questioned um, later down the line. So what do you think the trade-off is of keeping the deliberations uh, behind closed doors, even though there is a information gathering period uh, which precedes those deliberations that is open to the public? Uh, do you have any opinions on that trade-off and if it's worth it? Oh, are you there? Sorry, I muted myself uh, so I could chew on a cough drop for a second so that my, no I don't fully lose lose my voice. Um, yeah, I'm tempted to comment, but I don't. It, I mean, I could look. I'm looking at their. Uh, wait, I think it's looking at climate. Um, I'm looking at just one of the climate statements on their website just to get a sense of the kinds of things that they. Yeah. Say, um, I think the assessment comes up uh, in the Google search before the report does, which was interesting. I don't know if that just happened for me, but. So what should I Google? Uh, well, I mean, I, I don't know if there's going to be a lot on the report itself. You can look up the National Academies of Sciences deliberation process. Um, but I had to dig pretty deep to find an outline of, of their process. So I'm just wondering what you think about this trade-off of keeping deliberations and debate behind closed doors uh, versus uh, opening it up to the public and risking that some of the conclusions in the report will be questioned because it was just left all out in the open. Like, do you think it's worth having those deliberations behind closed doors to get that uniform message? I mean, probably not, and certainly not in the name of a uniform message. So I think that part of it is that the part of the job of a consensus. So I think it's what uh, you know. What I talked about with the role of consensus, it's really to give a sense of the range of viewpoints, and the people who are in the majority or want to be seen as being in the majority, they they can think, yeah, I don't want people to know about these minority opinions because I think they're wrong and they're in the minority so why do we need to talk about them but I, I think it's I think you really have to have it as no there are a lot of if, if you know depending on the range of opinions but if it's if it's like one percent then you can say that and it's part of partially you can say okay here's what we think and I think it would be good if, if you actually let the people uh you know you let the people respond kind of like happens with the supreme court decisions so there's the decision made by people and that's an interesting model actually that i haven't i hadn't thought about until now but that's a case where there's a definite consensus because you have whatever five or more of the justices voting a certain way right. and then there's a minority opinion and i think sometimes they have more than one dissent i forget but they definitely have at least one dissent and then people can think about it and process it and it's really valuable i mean imagine if it was just the supreme court had one opinion and you didn't know anything about the different kinds of disagreements that would be a disservice to the public it would be a disservice to uh future people so i think it's I, I, in general there are certain situations where you don't want um where you want privacy to kind of discuss certain things, but I think at the very least, you need transparency about the range of opinions and you want the minority opinions to be able to voice what they say, including, uh, you know, including, well, you know, whatever they have to say, but you can say, yeah, it's, it's uh, this is a minority opinion, or in some cases it might be split 60, uh, 60 40 and i don't know i haven't thought about exactly how to do it but you know one if you look at these different kinds of consensus things part of what you really want to do is ask the right questions and mm -hmm. and that's one of the big issues i have with climate how it's portrayed and i think the key thing the whole context of this of concern with climate today is the view that the fossil fuels that drive the whole global economy that are 80 percent of the world's energy that's powering all our machines that they have a 
you know, concerning side effect of CO2 emissions that are driving rising CO2 levels. So the real question is, I mean, you could divide it into two, but are they having a significant influence on climate? And then ultimately significant has to mean like severely detrimental to human life, where you would consider restricting energy use, uh, which is going to be detrimental for sure, uh, to to uh, mitigate the 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 damage of the rising CO2 levels. And so for the climate scientists, you the pure climate scientists, you would want to know more about just, okay, kind of how many degrees of temperature and what kinds of storm patterns and stuff. And then from the more adaptation slash economics people, you want to know, okay, how significant is that? But if you notice the way it's framed in most of these things or the primary way a lot of these surveys are done is, do you believe that humans have an influence on climate? And that that might be one question to ask, but it's not really the important question. It'd be like asking, you know, do you think antibiotics have side effects? Well, yeah, but the whole question is how significant are they? And you know, with different antibiotics, the answer is very different, and the benefits are different, and then you make very different decisions based on that. But with fossil fuels, they all basically all emit quite a bit of CO two. Natural gas a little less than coal, uh, a little less than oil, which is a little less than coal, but still a lot. So it's it really needs to be: are these actually like is this dangerous? That's that's the key question, and you can subdivide that. And I think that that question cannot be equated with: is there any? Uh, does CO two cause um, any warming? So I think I would just say get clear, get clear on the question, and the question has to this, the question or questions have to be very clearly connected to making policy decisions that are beneficial to human life. So I'd say the questions need to be better you need to have a lot more transparency about what people think. And then you'd want to know, maybe even just percentage-wise, once you have good questions, and maybe you have several of them to get the range of opinions, then you'd want to know, okay, what, what, uh, like what summaries of the evidence do the people who, agree, who have the majority, like what will they sign on to? And what will the people who are in the minority sign on to? And then maybe you give them a chance to uh, respond. I think that would be really useful. And if, if you could you know, whatever the outcome was. And I think the fear is that, oh, well, well, you know, my view, we can't get people in lockstep if there's disagreement, but there's going to be, of course, you're making decisions all the time with probabilities. You know, you make decisions about whether to go to war with probabilities. So I think if you communicated the probabilities objectively, and let's say the position that I disagree with was true, that, wow, there's really a significant problem. There's going to be very rapid warming. It's going to lead to uniformly negative other climate consequences. They're going to overwhelm our adaptive abilities. It's really a, uh, and, and let's also say that alternatives are right, are basically already ready to replace fossil fuels. Um, like if they said that, or let's say they, let's say 90% of the scientists said that, and 90% and of the economists said that, I think people should take that really seriously. And they shouldn't just say, Oh, well, 10% disagree, so let's not do anything. The idea is, no, the probabilities, and particularly if you can get good evidence, so I think you could really have good consensus type uh, reasoning. Uh, consensus, I think that kind of consensus in form would be good. Again, I, I don't think that those conclusions are true, and I don't think they would be borne out even remotely by any kind of objective statement of consensus. But no matter what the truth is, I think it's good to have the range of opinions and the reasons for them given by the people who have the different opinions. Right. So for these consensus reports, volume one of the assessments, you talked about, you know, this division of labor. And I think it ties into this question in some of your previous writings where you talk, you talk about wanting the experts to be the decision makers on the consensus that you want climate scientists to decide the consensus on climate science. And I was wondering, um, with, let's see, the decision makers being limited to climate scientists, I wanted to confirm that that was your stance, that for the consensus reports, you'd prefer that to be limited to climate scientists in this dialogue. And then for the risk assessments, uh, which, involves decision makers in economics in other fields, would you be more comfortable with various disciplines getting involved? Or do you similarly want that limited to economists making the risk assessments 
Um, I'm just curious who you think the key voices are in these volume one versus volume two reports. Yeah, that's a really interesting question, particularly with the climate one, because sciences overlap a lot. And so you would want, um, like for example, I don't think that my opinion would belong in, in one of these. So I might think I know a decent amount about this stuff, but I, so I have no, I have no formal training in this. You know, I, don't, I mean, I don't have a, even a BA in any science, let alone a PhD. Um, but there's a real question of what about physicists? Like, what about physicists who have studied this issue? And often, you know, often you have problems in fields that are that are identified by people outside the field. So I think that. Uh, and, and there can be all sorts of biases in in uh, in getting it. So that's a really good question. How do you how do you get the right range of people where you're not in danger of just having a current clique that's locked into what could be called their paradigm? Although I don't love that word. How do you avoid that? But then how do you avoid also having just random cranks, just uh, voice. Right. And I think it would be something like, you know, you, I mean, this, this would, you'd want some kind of unbiased people to determine this, but I think it would be something like the, like, cli I mean, climate science, there are multiple climate sciences anyway, but with like closely related fields. So I don't think every physicist, but there might be, um, like, there's this guy, I'm not, I don't express an opinion on whether he's right about things or not, but there, there's this controversial guy uh, named William Happer uh, from Princeton, and he has been critical of uh, you know, certainly like climate catastrophe, what he would consider climate catastrophe, thinking what I would, but his, you know, his background in physics is quite relevant to climate, particularly to understanding like how infrared radiation works, which is key, like the key thing that's involved in the greenhouse effect. So somebody like that, it makes total sense to have involved. If it's somebody who just does, you know, like theoretical, uh, like who builds like particle accelerators and is just a researcher, that doesn't seem like they would be relevant. So I think you would just want people in the relevant fields. And part of what you would want to know is actually what would be really interesting is to know you might even subdivide it and say, well, what are the people like we did this, this survey of scientists and here's what they think scientists in related fields. And then here's what, and oh, there was a big difference between the people who are experts in infrared or whatever the broader category there is uh, versus the climate people. So I, I, yeah, I think it should be people with relevant uh, domain knowledge and I think that would protect against most of the errors that I'm talking about. I also think that there, there's, you raise this issue of public comment and I don't know exactly how it works but often it just seems to just be ignored. Uh, but I do think there is a real role for uh, public comment and for people to be aware of those comments in a way that uh, could you know, that, that could be influenced. For example, I would like, I might like to make a public comment. And if I did a good enough job, maybe even though I'm like, I'm a, I'm a synthesizer of these different fields who's, who didn't get formally educated in any of them, maybe if it had enough merit, people would uh, spread it. So I think you want something like that, but I, I do think you should get people with domain specific knowledge. In the adaptation thing, yeah, it's economists are part of it. Uh, I mean, in a sense, you need like a modern equivalent of an anthro uh, anthropologist, uh, but, and you would, and then also the whole thing we haven't mentioned at all is insofar as you're dealing with the, the, poli the different kinds of policy decisions, you need really objective experts about energy. And that's, that's I think, often uh, very much uh, left out. And I think the, the way it often happens, I don't know about the NCA, but often the the people in economics who get the most attention in climate tend to be not a representative sample 
of economists. They tend to be the people who say either, oh, it's really easy to replace uh, fossil fuels with renewable energy, or who just say something like the economic consequences of this are going to be completely um, unmanageable. Although I guess I should say the the uh, the guy who won the Nobel Prize, Nordhaus, is actually a lot more measured on this stuff, and that's he gets a, he's been getting a lot of flack from the mainstream type catastrophists because what he's saying isn't dramatic enough for them. Mm -hmm. So I think it's interesting that you mentioned you feel the public comment part is ignored. I didn't realize also that these public comment periods were happening until I looked into it, and then I saw that before that final draft of the, uh, I think it, it's the risk assessment, that there is that public comment and they actually get responses too to their comments from, I, I guess, people from the academies. So would you maybe say we need to publicize this more? Yeah, what's, well, I mean, they can't respond to everybody, right? So how, do that, what, how does that work? That's, that sounds like a promising thing. That, yeah. that should be more publicized. But how many people get response? How many people get responses? Well, I when I found the document, I'll send it to you. It was like pages and pages. Maybe it was twenty pages, but each had maybe uh, ten or five to ten comments on each page. It was. It looked like screenshots transferred, actually. So uh, maybe not the most technologically updated records. But from what I saw, every comment was responded to and I don't know if it was sufficiently responded to but each one did have a comment following it so it would be interesting to look at those uh, and maybe at a later point get your opinion on how how those comments were responded to I mean I was interested in uh, who they were reaching in that public comment period because like I said I didn't even know that those were going on so who has access uh, during those those periods is a, is a question I have but uh, yeah, I guess you would say that if there is public comment, you would be you would sign up. It seems. Yeah, if there was a real chance of it getting seen, I've done. I'm trying to remember if I've done more than one. I did one when I was living in San Francisco a couple of years ago, and I forget it was on some. I don't know if it was on a clean power plan or something, but it was. It was on something uh, about energy policy, as one might expect, and I went there and. If it's just the, I just did it because I was there and I thought, oh, maybe this will influence somebody. And I, I recorded it and posted it on YouTube, but I didn't, ex I don't know. I don't know. Do you, I, I just don't know of any, any examples where there's a public comment and then people really change their minds. It, it has the feeling of a formality to me, but I, I would love to see how it's done in this case, particularly if they're responding. So I would, I would certainly participate in any, I would make a public comment on any major decision where I thought there was any chance of it influencing anybody. But I, I, I have been largely pessimistic about that, but I would love to uh, be persuaded to become optimistic mm -hmm. about that. Definitely, I'll send it to you. So the fact that these volumes are released separately an entire year apart, the uh, descriptive one happening first, probably to lay the foundation, does that comfort you in any way or do you think it doesn't make a difference because you don't seem satisfied with the risk assessment that follows a year later? Um, let's see, I'm just pulling this up. Um, I think the well, question, I, yeah, I, yeah. Here, go ahead. I was gonna say, to clarify the question, I thought it was interesting that they're released one year apart and I was trying to think why they would put the descriptive consensus report a year before the prescriptive risk assessment. Um, and I, I was wondering what you thought about that gap that they provide there. Uh, I mean, it makes more sense than doing it in the opposite direction. That's mm -hmm. for sure. I mean, you can't say here's what to do and I'll give you my reasons in a year. Uh, just my, my experience with this these things is that the the reports as communicated to the public, I just consider wild distortions of every relevant thing. That is, wild distortions of what's likely to happen in climate, uh, certainly how that's likely to affect adaptable human beings, and then the view that fossil fuels can easily be replaced by, by alternatives. 
particularly renewables. Mm -hmm. So my, I mean, my view is just that it's not, so there, the, and that could be subdivided in that how much of that is disagreement with the main street, with whatever consensus does exist. So like how much is it, I, I disagree with the average of the views on those three questions and how much is it that I think it's distorted. And I, I'm sure I disagree with the average viewpoint, but I think there's less divergence between my viewpoint and the average viewpoint than between the average viewpoint and what's in what's publicized about that assessment. And this mm -hmm. is this is where I think I think Lomborg, Bjorn Lomborg is generally good uh, on this issue. And his book False Alarm, and and he had a really interesting exchange with uh, this guy Joseph Stiglitz, who's a Nobel Prize winning economist, although it has nothing to do with uh, climate. And Stiglitz was criticizing Lomborg, but also uh, what's his name, Nordhaus, who was the, the climate economist who won the Nobel Prize. And there's really interesting, well, you could read Stiglitz's review and then Lomborg responds to it point by point with all original citations of what the UN actually says. And I, I mean, Lomborg's already more inclined to my view, but to say the least, but I, I think he was just completely convincing that, that what Stiglitz is saying and then what even people a lot less sophisticated than Stiglitz is saying is far from a summary of the average like like the dominant view in the field. So I, I think these assessments are just huge distortions and there are a lot of, at least the ones I've seen in the past and particularly, I shouldn't say, the, the assessments as communicated to the public because there, there's stuff in the assessments. There's this really interesting guy named uh, Tony Hiller who's a very controversial uh, guy and he has, you know, his one of the main things he does is he makes videos and about using primary source data, but he'll often, if I remember correctly, use data from national climate assessment showing things. Mm -hmm. But it's he's taking it from the parts of it that nobody ever sees. Mm -hmm. Not the parts that summarize it and say, oh, it's a catastrophe. Right. Do you think that no matter what the national climate assessment says, no matter what the academies do, it really comes down to how the mass media, you could say, like the big outlets report it. Uh, do you think that they have the final say ultimately in how the public perceives the findings? Or do you think the, the academies can do things to uh, make their message clearer and, and stop the distortion of their content? Oh, I think there's a huge amount they can do, but I just want to make clear there are people within the different academies or the UN who are that there's there's the two distortions but there there's the distortion of the that that occurs between the in-depth research and the summary of the research and then the distortion that occurs between the summary of the research and then the media's reporting of it but i think the first distortion is often bigger that is the distortion of the that the summary of the research is doing um, of the in-depth research. And, and sometimes if you take the UN and what they've done, I don't have the quote in front of me, but the secretary of the Gen general of the UN basically said after, I think it was the 2018 1.5 degrees Celsius report that the IPCC put out. I mean, he, he basically said the human race is gonna become extinct. And there was just nothing even resembling that. So that's a case where it's not the New York Times said that maybe they picked up on, I'm sure they reported that, uh, that quote, but it's these organizations, like the pe the people who run these organizations, they have their own ideas and uh, and agendas, and there's a huge potential. Whenever you're saying I represent everybody, there's a huge um, there's a huge potential to distort uh, the opinion, and I think that that happens. There's a whole there's a bunch of really interesting reasons why I think. Uh, it gets distorted, but it's. Yeah, I, I think in practice, it's it's been it's been distorted, and the the people within these organizations who are in charge of communicating to the public, I think they're the guiltiest people. I think the second guiltiest are the media. Mm -hmm. So when these leading figures are politicians and they're misquoting scientists, do you think scientists, especially the ones that they're misquoting? Are responsible for correcting them? 
Yes. Uh, there's an interesting, so a good, a good example of this is, um, I'm almost positive I have the numbers that I'm correctly remembering the numbers, but there's this guy, Michael Schellenberger, who recently released the book called Apocalypse Never. And one thing he's good at is he just calls the scientists when they're quoted and asks, say hey, what, and there was one guy in particular who had projected that um, it was on the order of, he had projected according to the Guardian, let me just see if I can pull it up, because I think I can pull it up quickly. Uh, Michael Schellenberger, Guardian. Uh, right, I'm familiar with Michael Schellenberger, actually. I saw his, what was his film called? Pandora's Box, I think? Pandora's Promise. Pandora's Promise. Right. Yeah, I, I actually uh, never watched that, surprisingly, even though I'm a big uh, nuclear guy. Okay, let me just see if I can, let me see. I, think, I think I pulled up the right article. Okay, here we go. So this is in his book too, but it's, it publishes in a, a Forbes article. So there is Extinction Rebellion, which I'm guessing you've heard of, this UK-based group that's saying that fossil fuel use and uh, rising CO2 levels are leading to ultimately mass extinction, including human extinction. And one of the spokesmen said, uh, oh, so they're, they're referring to Sarah Lunnan, who's one of the main spokespeople, who said the science is, uh, it's not Sarah Lunnan saying billions of people are going to die. The science is saying we're headed to four degrees warming and people like Kevin Anderson of the Tyndall Center and Johan Rockstrom from the Potsdam Institute for Climate Impact Research were saying that such a temperature rise is incompatible with civilized life. Johan said he could not see how an earth at four degrees Celsius warming could support a billion or even half billion people. And so there's an article in The Guardian that said, quoted this guy, Johan Rockstrom, saying, it's difficult to see how we could accommodate a billion people or even half that at a four degree temperature rise. Uh, and then Schellenberger talks about how the IPCC reports say nothing resembling that, uh, but then he calls up Rockstrom. So already Rockstrom is like in an, an incredibly extreme view that's being taken as, oh, this is what all scientists say. Then it turns out, uh, here's what he says. It's not that he said a billion people or even half that. He said, it's difficult to see how we could accommodate eight billion people or even half that, as in four billion people. Now, just think about that. You've, you've been quoted uh, as saying half a billion or only a billion, like seven or seven and a half billion people will die. And you actually said that, you know, between zero and four billion, but probably more. For, now, both of those are extreme, but that's a huge... Uh, kind of, of uh, difference. And then there's an interesting discussion if you read the book or this article where um, Schellenberger asks him, well, have you ever looked at what would happen with food production at four degrees warming? And Rockstrom says, that's a good question. I must admit, I've not seen, seen, seen a study. It seems like such an important, it seems like such an interesting and important question. And then it turns out that uh, two of his colleagues at the Potsdam Institute had done that. And then uh, they said the finding was that actually the climate change policies of restricting fossil fuel use were more likely to hurt food production and worsen rural poverty, rural poverty than climate change itself, even at four to five degrees Celsius warming. So this guy is a crank, but he, like part of it is I'm bringing this up mostly because he's completely misquoted by one of the most prominent newspapers in Europe and really the world. And it doesn't even bother him. Mm -hmm. to the point of correcting it. It's, and it's, so that's an extreme example of, I think, a common phenomenon. And this is really what I'm combating against, is that there is so little value accorded to low-cost, reliable energy and so little appreciation of how good fossil fuels are at producing it and how difficult it is to do what we do with fossil fuels with other things. That's, that's such a small value in people's minds that their view of climate is, well, even if it's a little bad, we might as well, we might as well stop using fossil fuels. Like, well, what's the downside? And for me, that's like saying, well, it, it, what's the downside of outlawing antibiotics? Well, antibiotics lengthen probably billions of lives, certainly hundreds of billions of lives. I think they have more severe side effects than fossil fuels do, more problematic long-term ones. But in any case, nobody would say with antibiotics, you can only look at the side effects. And 
so that's what's happening i think is that because people don't see real benefits to fossil fuels they don't it's not a moral issue for them to stand up so they feel like yeah even if these people are exaggerating which they'll say all the time behind the scenes what's the harm and my view is no the harm is actually billions of people's lives because you're talking about people being able to afford energy which allows them to use machines which allows them to, to live a modern life so that's my explanation of why they don't stand up but certainly you're you're obligated to stand up i mean if somebody used my research prominently i would definitely and it was wrong i would definitely challenge them whatever direction it was in right. if it was like more pro fossil fuels than i think is warranted i would challenge it and if it was less i would challenge it right and it's not an ego thing it's not about you it's just about what you found and the content of of what you researched well i i mean i i don't exactly know what ego thing means but it's it's a like, like it's not about um putting your name out there behind the message and i have to correct you that's not what i said it's about what you said not the fact that you said it and for any scientist is what you're saying yeah right yeah any thinker i mean you could just think of it as I mean, medical advice is a good analogy just to get the seriousness of it. I mean, if you're a doctor and you make a public statement, let's just say with treatment of the coronavirus and, and it, your view gets misrepresented, you feel like, well, if people act on this view, then people are going to die on this. If people act on the view, on the misrepresentation of my view, then they're going to, they're, more people are going to die. And so that's how, if you, if you think you're right about these issues, you think that you've thought them through carefully, that's how you would feel about a misrepresentation. Unless, again, you don't think that there are trade-offs and you think it makes sense to get rid of fossil fuels no matter what, then you don't really care if people are exact. I mean, then you still should, but it doesn't seem that important because you don't, it doesn't feel like there's any downside to restricting mm -hmm. fossil fuels. Mm -hmm. And I understand how when we talk about this, we can feel like there are voices missing. Uh, in a recent publication from the U.S. Department of Commerce, when I say recent, I mean 2017, because the NCA only comes out every four years. And it said that the National Academies of Sciences and the Royal Society recognized that research on the feasibilities and consequences of CI actions, I think that stood for climate impact, is incomplete and call for continued research to improve knowledge of the feasibility, risks, and benefits of those techniques. So that was a comment on that fourth national climate assessment. And they're saying uh, that it's incomplete and the call, they're calling for more research when I went back into the NCA and I read the risk assessment and I and then I went back to the report, I have to say I did not see talks about the benefits of fossil fuels. So I understand why you were compelled to write your book about about them and the and the benefits. Um, do you feel like how how seriously do you take this? call for continued research to improve the feasibility risks and benefits when the current risk assessments do not explicitly address uh, the, the counter argument to fossil fuel uh, reduction? I mean, you can probably guess my answer to that. Yeah. I, 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 because, I mean, here's a, here's a perspective on it. I think that it's, you know, the role that fossil fuels play in our life. I mean, I, I have a very, I'm very energy centered in my thinking about what benefits human life. So, and I could, maybe I could err on being too energy centric, but I mean, you know, the difference, I mean, the difference between having reliable low-cost energy or not is the difference between a machine labor civilization and a manual labor civilization manual labor civilization human beings lived in that for a couple hundred thousand years and people billions of people around the world still live in that and that's an incredible and places like venezuela are regressing to that but we know that's so bad for human life when human beings primarily rely on their own physical power versus allowing machines 
to do. I was just researching agriculture today and I calculated my back of the napkin calculation was, you know, harvester can um, do a modern combine harvester, somebody running that can do 740 times more uh, wheat production than an individual. If you look at like the cutting and threshing, it's like you make an individual 740 times more productive. That's the kind of thing that allows 2% of us or so to be involved in agriculture and for us to spend all kinds of time on things, including researching how to combat like really bad virus that we're dealing with. So I just think that it's, people view it as all the risk is on the side of disrupting the delicate balance of our environment and climate system. And I think so much of the risk is on the, is on anything that disrupts our incredibly energy dependent standard of living. So I don't think there's, I just think, I just think that people should feel so much risk with regard to restricting fossil fuels and such a high burden of proof about claims that they can be uh, easily replaced. And I think it's just part of what's wrong with the, the view that, this has gotten a lot worse in the last several decades, the view that the main thing that matters in, when assessing energy policy in general and fossil fuel policy in particular is climate science. I think that very much has to be viewed, be viewed as, this is one consideration among many, uh, but main thing, you, no matter what, you need experts in energy and economics. Well, right. How much climate expertise you need depends on the sever potential severity of climate. Mm -hmm. So to follow up to that question, I was mostly providing context. Um, so I'm, I'm hoping that this question also lends itself better to a, to a better answer, to more of an answer. Um, I guess, would you rather the risk assessment address hydrocarbon fuels uh, in, in the hydrocarbon fuel industry? Or would you rather it leave it out entirely from the conversation? Because right now, the quote I gave calls for including it more. Um, but it seems like, you know, you're not so satisfied with, with how they do that anyway. So should they even include that in their assessment? Yes. I mean, if you want my view, I think of it as the assessment should be doing what the moral case for fossil fuels is claiming to do. And, and why, what I say claiming to do means to the moral case for fossil fuels, the, the version that's out now and the, the future version that will be out next year, like it's, its goal is to give an objective assessment of the benefits and side effects of continuing fossil fuel use versus you know, different degrees of not using it. Right? I think you cannot, you cannot, so I just disagree with the whole idea of a climate assessment. I mean, maybe I should have said that. The answer. I disagree with the climate assessment that is not intimately also an energy assessment because they in the same way i would disagree with the, an antibiotic side effects assessment that didn't talk about the benefits of the anti of antibiotics and the alternatives or lack thereof for replacing them so i, I think the whole thing should be uh reframed right there are energy sections for sure but i understand why you'd want it to be more comprehensive in in how it addresses uh, hydrocarbon fuels. So I guess I'll wrap it up with, with uh, a broader question I I left from the beginning and I, I set it aside because we, we got specific pretty quickly. But I think this is a fun question and um, I'm curious to know what you think. The, I guess I'll present two options for you on how you would define science or the scientific process. Would you define it as finding the truth or the, the pursuit of the truth? Or would you say it's the elimination of uncertainty about the truth? Oh, I don't usually like when I'm given two options. <laughs> I usually don't agree with either. Um... Or you could, yeah, you don't have to pick one if you really disagree with both, but I'm curious then why you would not choose one. Well, or the... what, what do you think of the, so why do you divide it into those categories? Right. I divided it into those categories because of that, uh, I think it was Forbes article you mentioned where you took issue with some people saying scientific consensus, that's an oxymoron. Uh, and you said, no, no, it doesn't have to be. And I thought, I totally understood that argument uh, that it's an oxymoron because so much of science is uncertainty. You know, you 
isolate a single variable at a time when you can in a perfect world and you really hack away at what you don't know for sure, but you can create some semblance of a common agreement as a, as a, to move forward. You know, like we, with Mendel, he, he found out that there was inheritance and then from inheritance, we figured out the structure of DNA. And then from DNA, we went to CRISPR, you know, those are big leaps, but I think there's this idea that each advancement we make next will solidify what we knew before and we can never fully be certain uh, because you know like you, you said earlier in this conversation scientists have been wrong about things and what science really is is having uncertainty developing a hypothesis and then generally you know you you negate you reject the null like you you confirm that something is not happening but that and that's done more than saying this phenomenon is actually is actually occurring. Um, so so there's so much of science that is uncertainty, and I I guess what I'm saying is also I side with the the second, which is I, there there is a truth to this world, but how close we'll get to it via the scientific process, uh, I don't know if it's as perfect of a system, and that really confines how we think about consensus, I think. So that, that's why I'm curious to see what you think about it. Gotcha. Okay, that, thanks for that explanation. That was helpful. So I definitely, I think of it more as it's about the pursuit of truth and elimination of uncertainty is a means to pursuing the truth. But ultimately, it's you know something like the systematic study of or quest for you know, understanding cause and effect relationships in the world. I and mean, that's really the, the goal that you're after is understanding cause and effect in, in different kinds of ways. And we are amazed, I mean, if you look at different, and I think we really need to make distinctions among air, areas of science that have established causality more and less definitively. I think it's one of the big problems is that people equate everyone engaged in the scientific quest, that there, there's too much of an equality among them. And it's great that we have people who are nowhere near clear about the truth. And to use your terminology, there's a lot of uncertainty that they haven't eliminated. And that's great. And, and in fact, most active people are going to want to be on the frontier. They're not just going to be studying things that they regard as completely uh, established. Maybe if they want to try to contradict something, then, then they'll be interested. But most people will be on the frontier in the realm of uncertainty, uh, where there's the most uncertainty. But I, I mean, I think they clearly are building on massive achievements. And part of the, the evidence of that is just so much of our modern world is built on these achievements. And the kind of modern example is just how, uh, I mean, quantum mechanics, which even if it's not fully understood, like it's understood, the behavior is well enough understood where the, the whole modern digital, all the digital industries uh, depend on it and it can just make predictions with incredible degrees of precision and that's something that should be really respected and i think it those that kind of causal understanding and predictive ability is partially is why science is so respected but also why science is often a lot of people have science envy and that includes just fields outside science that try to put everything in mathematical formulas. I think economists are often guilty of this, but also immature sciences or, or non-validated theories often do this. And I think this happens a lot with climate science, where in terms of climate prediction, human beings are not very good at it at this point. It's really difficult and there's no, nothing to be ashamed of, but there's a big desire to be able to say, oh, we can predict that it's gonna be 3.7 degrees Celsius warmer by the year. 2090 instead of just saying you know what i i i at most know that i at most am confident this is one driver but i don't know how it'll work out it's it's too much that the people think of climate scientists as they think of that science as the same as the science involved in making modern electronics work like they're not drawing distinctions among the very different levels of established knowledge, or you could call it maturity. And 
this leads to one final point about science, which is that science is both of the, the answers you gave are both methods. And I think that's right. Science is primarily a method. I mean, it's an area of inquiry, but it's, it's based on certain kinds of methods. And the big danger today is that science is viewed as an institution, too much like the Catholic Church or a comparable thing, where it hands down decrees. And what any scientific institution should do is it should be encouraging the right methods, and then it should be reporting as objectively as possible on, okay, what do different people claiming to follow these methods uh, say? But if you look at how a lot of these assessments are done, it's much more like, oh, the, you know, the Catholic Church uh, handed this down. And in fact, that the Catholic Church's opinions on climate science are widely spread now. I think because, and that's, I think this is an example of how it's, you know, how it's viewed as, as an institution. So I, again, I want to just clarify that. I don't think you're at risk of misinterpreting me, but I think other people could be. It's like, I'm very in favor of having these kinds of institutions and seeking for consensus, but it really has to follow procedures that are going to enable us to accurately know what different scientists think and why so that we can integrate it with what specialists in other fields think and why and then have the best possible chance of making a good decision. Mm -hmm. It's that scientific process behind so many disciplines but when we reach different conclusions we have to treat them differently and not not treat them all the same is what you're saying. Uh, well, I'm not sure what you mean by different. I mean, I, I'm focused on that you want to know part of part of knowing the reasoning of something and part of having counter arguments is you can get a sense of how, like, how to what extent has the scientific method been performed to its fullest. So if you have something about, you know, you ask a consensus statement on the law of universal gravitation, I'll bet you're going to get 100%. Now, there are people who can say different things about different aspects of it, but in terms of GMM over R squared, I never heard of a modern scientist who says that's not true. And part of it, that has gone through a lot of, uh, that has gone through a lot of validation. And people should recognize the level of validation involved there is very different than the validation, certainly, of a, an average of climate simulation models. Mm. Thanks so much for sharing that. I know that was a really uh, abstract, even vague question, but I appreciate your thoughts on it. Thanks to Emily for initiating that interview. I hope you listeners and viewers found it interesting. Okay, just a quick update before I wrap up. Go to energytalkingpoints.com. That's been my refrain lately. Uh, it's still my refrain. It seems like in this election, Everything besides energy just keeps getting brought up. Now it's Supreme Court issues before it was impeachment and, uh, you know, unrest and coronavirus and all these things are important to address in different kinds of ways. But energy is still the industry that powers every other industry. There are huge energy choices in selection. People need to be informed. So go to energytalkingpoints.com, have some new talking points up on the California blackouts that also contain a lot of information about reliable electricity in general. So please check those out, share them with people. Uh, let's see, anything else? Well, there are two uh, upcoming documentaries that I'm in at least a little bit. One that I'm in very little, but that's still interesting is the documentary Climate Hustle 2 uh, by Mark Morano and CFACT. So that premieres on September 24th. And so if you go to Climate Hustle or climatehustle2.com, if you just Google that, uh, maybe Google has suppressed it actually, but hopefully you can find that. And if you want to get tickets, check that out. I'm just in there for about five or 10 seconds. Um, but it, I think it's got a lot of ma interesting material in particular on what they call climate monarchy, which is the phenomenon of using the climate issue in a, in a very dictatorial way. And in particular, I think the movie is really good at showing how much children are being manipulated and how much pseudoscientific education there is, really miseducation of children there is. And I found that uh, particularly valuable. The other one is called, the, it's called Religion of Green by Prager University. I'm not sure when it's coming out, but it should be very soon at PragerU.com. That one I'm definitely featured in 
uh, quite prominently along with Michael Schellenberger, whom I've had on the show. And I think that one raises, uh, does a good job of looking at some of the core beliefs of the modern green movement, where they come from, why they're wrong, and it you know, puts it in the category of, uh, of religion, which is, I think, an important perspective to have on it. So certainly, in particular, I think the, the parts of it that Mike and I are in, I think we able, were able to make a, uh, a clarify, give a clarifying explanation of what's going on with the green movement, which is really the modern environmental movement, and, and to some extent offering an alternative, although the documentary is not really focused on a positive alternative. And I think that's really important. So that's one reason for Power Hour, for Moral Case for Fossil Fuels, is to really offer a positive human flourishing based alternative to the green movement. All right, I don't know if you can tell, but I'm, I'm losing my voice. So that's a good signal among others to wrap up. As always, if you have any questions, comments, love mail or hate mail, email me at alex at alexepstein.com. Again, go to energytalkingpoints.com. If you are interested in a speech, you can email me or you can go to industrialprogress.com slash speaking, doing a lot of new virtual speeches these days. And if you wanna support our work, our research and development and marketing efforts, you can go to industrialprogress.com slash accelerate. Finally, make sure you're on our email list, industrialprogress.com, enter in your email and you'll be good to go getting all the latest updates. All right, next week, I am slated to have a really interesting guest to talk about America's rigged electricity markets. Until then, I'm Alex Epstein. This has been Power Hour. Power Hour. Life, liberty, and the pursuit of energy. Power Hour, the antidote to shallow thinking about energy issues.